friends, welcome to the All Canadian Reptile Girl. I'm Annalise, and so far, I'm immortal. This is my corn snake, Goggles. I'm not sure if you can tell from way over there, but he's a little strange. Can we go to B-roll here? How are they gonna see this from that far away? That's better. Ooh, <gasps> ah. That's right, Goggles is a scaleless corn snake. Isn't he cool? As cool as he is, some people take exception to these guys and think we shouldn't be breeding them or keeping them as pets. Is this opinion justified or is it an example of folks reacting emotionally to something they don't really understand? Maybe a bit of both? Let's find out. Goggles may be a scaleless corn snake, but this doesn't mean he doesn't have scales. He does. He's got his ventral scales, which are important for locomotion, so he can move around without any trouble. There's a scattering of scales along his back and here and there. He also has his brill scales, the transparent scales that cover his eyes, giving him this kind of bug-eyed appearance. Some people think that this is an indication that there is something wrong with their eyes, which is understandable. Bug eyes in snakes can be a genetic defect or an infection or other health problem. But with scaleless corn snakes, they are missing the rest of the normal scales on their face and around their eyes, making the eye scales that they do have stand out. Goggles, get it? So what's the deal with these guys? How does a scaleless snake come to be? Is this an example of genetic fiddling run amok? Are scaleless corn snakes at a disadvantage over their scaled relatives? Do they actually have health issues from not having scales? Should these not be? Sure they should. There are other scaleless reptile species that have been bred which do have significant potential issues. However, I'm not looking to explore all that. I want to keep today about scaleless corns as much as possible. Simply put, this is a genetic mutation. It's believed that the gene responsible for this actually comes from Texas rat snakes and was carried to corn snake populations through hybridization. Corn snakes are a species of rat snake after all, so hybridization between corn snakes and other rat snakes is not uncommon where their ranges overlap in the wild. This mutation did not originate with breeders doing selective breeding or stumbling across this by accident. It was introduced into the hobby through wild caught specimens and has continued with captive breeding. This is a naturally occurring trait in the wild. It's rare and, as a recessive gene, can only be passed when two specimens, who may look like normal snakes themselves by the way, that possess this rare gene happen to breed and pass the gene on to some of their offspring. Defenders of scaleless corn snakes will often point to the fact that they are naturally occurring in the wild as a point of defense against those who suggest that they should not be bred. But just because a mutation occurs in nature does not mean it's a good thing. We find six-legged frogs hopping around in the wild all the time. Doesn't mean that we should be intentionally breeding frogs that way. Yeah, to be fair, the six-legged frog thing is usually a result of a parasite or pollution as opposed to a natural mutation, but you get the idea. Mutations are random. Sometimes they help increase the chance of an animal making it to adulthood and breeding, passing on those advantageous genes. Sometimes they are a disadvantage and decrease an animal's chance at survival. Unless a trait is so strongly harmful that individuals do not survive to reproduction, even a deleterious trait can be maintained by genetic drift for a long time, especially if the population is large. So just because it's natural doesn't make it good in and of itself. The fact that we find robust healthy adult specimens in the wild help suggest it may not be detrimental, but you can't definitively say that just because it's in nature. So let's look at some other aspects of this. Many critics of scaleless corn snakes most often cite similar common concerns as to why they ought not be bred. The lack of scales reduces their capacity to retain moisture, they dehydrate faster, and are prone to trouble with shedding. Without scales, scaleless corn snakes have more difficulty in thermoregulating. They are bug-eyed and have problems with their vision. We've already covered the bug-eyed bit, so that's not an issue. And there is no evidence that they have problems with seeing, so nah. They are delicate. I have four fingers up, but four. let's just, I, oh, that does help. <laughs> they are delicate. Without their protective scales, their soft skin can rip and tear easily. They're prone to injury. It's also suggested that the lack of scales affords them less protection from the sun. And lastly, they are heavily inbred, which can result in genetic issues. Let's start with the notion that they have trouble retaining moisture. Without the hard, seemingly impermeable protective coat of scales to keep the dampness in, they dry out. But overall, 
this is not true. Quite the opposite, in fact. There have been several studies done on this exact topic, I'll link them below, on both captive and wild-caught specimens. They measured the water loss of scaled and scaleless snakes of different sizes and at various temperatures, and they concluded that scaleless snakes as a whole are actually slightly better at retaining moisture. You might run into individual scaleless snakes who have trouble shedding, but that could be true of any snake. As long as they are healthy and are provided humidity that corn snakes need regularly and when in shed, as a whole, scaleless corn snakes shouldn't have any trouble with dehydration or shedding their skin. So I guess that notion just doesn't hold water. <laughs> studies also looked at the ability to transfer heat between scaleless and scaled snakes. Scales provide additional surface area for heat transference, absorbing heat to warm up or letting it dissipate to cool off. The absence of scales should affect the ability for scaleless snakes to thermoregulate, and the studies did show that there was a difference. Scaleless snakes do warm up and cool down slower on average than their scaled counterparts, but only by a tiny margin. The effect on their ability to thermoregulate overall is negligible. The lack of scales do not put scaleless snakes at any kind of disadvantage when it comes to thermoregulation in the wild. And in captivity, where we can fine tune and control the temperatures for our snakes, it's a non-issue. Next up, let's tackle their skin's delicate reputation. Touching a scaleless corn snake is weird. It's kind of like a cross between velvet and soft, papery old person skin. But that's not quite it. It it certainly feels delicate, and I admit I was very surprised to learn that just like the dehydration thing, the delicate skin thing is not really true. I think there is no question that scales offer some protection to snakes in cases of an attack. How could they not? They are literally armor. But fending off teeth and claws aside, without that armor, are these scaleless snakes more prone to injury just snaking out and about? If they are, we would expect that wild-caught scaleless corn snakes would have significant significantly more injuries or scarring than their scaled friends. So what do researchers find when comparing normal snakes to scaleless? Well, generally speaking, they find no appreciable difference in evidence of injury overall between scaled and non-scaled corn snakes collected in the wild. I mean, it kind of makes sense when you really think about it. Skin is tough stuff, even without scales. There are plenty of scaleless critters moving around on the ground, under logs, and in between rocks without their skin falling apart like wet tissue paper. So why would scaleless snake skin be any different? For your scalelesses in captivity, you're just gonna wanna make sure that there isn't anything too pokey or sharp in their enclosure that they could cut themselves on. But this should be standard practice for any snake, right? In a fight with an animal with teeth and claws, I think it's reasonable to assume that scaled snakes have an advantage over scaleless snakes. But if you are caring for your pet scaleless corn snake properly, the chances of them taking a scratch or a bite from another animal is almost non-existent. Unless you're live feeding your scaleless corn snakes. Don't do that. The last bit on the topic of skin is regarding the lack of protection or increased sensitivity to the sun. This could be true. Intuitively, it makes sense that scales would help to block UV damage. But intuitively, it also made sense that they should be more delicate and prone to drying out. And yet, that didn't work out so well, yeah? But I haven't been able to find any proper sources in my searches so far to support or refute the concern of their skin in direct sunlight. In the sphere of being cautious and the absence of evidence to the contrary, let's say this one has merit. Although I don't really think it matters. If they are more sensitive to the sun, they're going to react to that and limit their exposure. They'll adjust where it's comfortable. In captivity, again, kind of a non-issue where we aren't normally keeping our pet snakes outside in direct sun. If you like taking your snakes outside for some fresh air and sunshine, like I do, weather permitting, it doesn't matter if your snake is scaled or scaleless. You should be providing them with access to cover or shade if they want it in any case. So again, again, kind of a non-issue. What else was there? Oh, uh, yeah, bug eyes. I already covered that. So I don't think we need to revisit that one. So inbreeding. Okay, here we go. The purpose of inbreeding, sometimes it's referred to as line breeding because that it just sounds better than inbreeding, but that's what it is, is to reduce the number of available genes within a breeding population and increase the likelihood of a desired trait. Certain colors or patterns or size, even behavioral traits depending on the animal. 
But just as desirable traits can be emphasized, undesirable traits or harmful traits can be as well. By the way, just because a trait is desirable for a breeder doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the animal. Ethics in breeding, not just reptiles, all animals, is a huge multifaceted discussion. I'm not looking to go into all of that here, I just want to keep it kind of high level and relating to this topic as much as possible. So when you say inbreeding, there tends to be this knee-jerk emotional reaction among people that it is inherently bad. It's not hard to understand why. We have laws about it for us. It's all over pop culture. Inbred mutated hillbilly monsters is a common horror trope. Marrying cousins in Alabama or Arkansas or whichever state is the unfair butt of a particular joke. It's a plot device in countless TV shows. There is no shortage of examples of human inbreeding which reinforce that it is bad for us. And it's through that human lens that we tend to view this for all animals. But cold-blooded animals are very different from warm-blooded. And the harmful results of inbreeding in reptiles is generally exaggerated. Inbreeding itself isn't going to spontaneously create drastic mutations. If you suddenly start getting snakes that can breathe out a stream of flaming spiders, it's not because of inbreeding. It's because that fire spider breathing gene existed in your breeding population and throughout inbreeding it was allowed to propagate and manifest itself. If the gene for breathing flaming spiders isn't in the genetic makeup of your breeding population, it isn't going to suddenly appear in numbers in a clutch of babies. That said, random, uncontrollable mutations can occur. So, if a random, isolated, undesirable trait pops up in a snake in your ongoing breeding project, don't breed that snake to another one. Keep that mutation out of the breeding population and other breeding projects. Just give that snake away as a pet only to someone who will give it a great home. Inbreeding is ubiquitous in the reptile hobby, even outside of trying to create morphs. Our captive bred population has been produced from a small number of wild caught animals. Pretty much every crested gecko in North America would be uncomfortably related for you and I. But even those initial wild-caught specimens could very easily have been inbred too. Inbreeding in the wild is probably less common than some herpetoculturalists suggest or would like to think, but it's not uncommon. That is how you get super dwarf retics or certain localities of species. It happens. In and of itself, inbreeding with genetically sound reptiles is not a problem. What is a problem is when breeders continue to breed animals with known genetic defects, visible or invisible, to each other in order to get a desired trait. The more you inbreed, the more likely it is for those defects to manifest themselves. If you're a breeder, you have to ask yourself whether you are more concerned about the welfare of the reptiles you are producing or about earning money at the expense of the reptile's health. Okay, this has nothing to do with scaleless corn snakes, but with how viscerally people react to the topic, I need to bring this up and head this off so that the comment section doesn't devolve into warring factions trying to yell at each other the loudest. When you talk about snake breeding, it is inevitable that someone is going to chime in about spider ball pythons. Please don't. I don't breed ball pythons. I don't intend to breed ball pythons. There's plenty of great people who have that covered. Working with the spider gene and the neurological problems associated with it is a far more nuanced topic than just spider gene bad. If you have a question or comment on the spider ball python gene, I suggest you take it to someone who is far more knowledgeable than I am to explain, debate, or contextualize the topic. Actually, I suggest starting with this video from Clint's Reptiles, when mine is done, of course. He does a great job explaining his perspective on it and uh, helps switch my thinking on it a little bit. There is a rule of thumb floating around amongst breeders that it is generally safe to interbreed for seven generations before you run into trouble. I found other numbers too, but seven seems to be the most common. I can find all sorts of trusted, knowledgeable people citing this and running their breeding program using it. That might be a good rule of thumb. It might not. In my research so far, I haven't actually found a single proper study or empirical evidence that says seven or any other number is the magic number. To me, it seems if you have weak genes, you might run into problems right away. Super solid genes may be good indefinitely. Maybe seven is a reasonable average. I can't say. What I can say is that to reduce your risk of running into problems, interbreed as little as you can get away with to still get your desired trait, then start outbreeding to get new solid genes into the mix as soon as you can. Okay, so that went way deeper than I intended. When it comes to scaleless corn snakes, breeding and inbreeding for this particular trait does not seem to be a problem. 
It doesn't appear that there are additional harmful genetic defects that go along with the scaleless gene. Knowingly breeding snakes with scaleless genes that have other unrelated genetic issues as well and allowing those weak genes to persist and affect the quality of life of the snake is not cool. There are definitely breeders out there looking to make a buck at the expense of the well-being of the snakes they produce. While I don't think that it represents the majority of breeders out there, it's prevalent enough that I think the inbreeding concern that critics of scaleless corn snakes cite is valid, just not quite to the degree or for the reason they usually think. The scaleless gene itself is not the problem. It's other genetic issues that can arise in these lungs. So how did we score on our arguments against scaleless corn snakes? Can't retain moisture? Bust it. Can't regulate heat? Bust it. Delicate, rippy skin? Bust it. Unhealthy eyes? Bust it. Genetic problems from inbreeding? Confirm? Let's say plausible in some circumstances, but the concerns really could be the same for any breeder regardless of the species they work with. Of our five common arguments against scaleless corn snakes, we've got four. Maybe four and a half of them busted. Not too shabby. How do you like meeting Goggles? He is so laid back and relaxed. He's done a few of the last birthday parties of the year and did amazing. He's certainly a favorite. A special shout out to my friends on Patreon. It's through their support that I can make fun videos and build Goggles, a cool bioactive enclosure that I'll be working on over the winter. My patrons get early access to my videos and get to meet animals like Goggles way before anyone else. If you wanna help me out and see what other perks you can get, head on over to patreon.com slash allcanadianreptilegirl. You can also help by hitting that like button and hitting subscribe. It helps spread this video to others who might enjoy it. Thanks to you all for watching and until next time, remember to nurture all nature. Bye. Touching a snail's corn snake, a snail list. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they don't have snails, but uh, that's not the right word. Just so you know. Are you snail list, sir? Hi, buddy. My boy. My sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs>